Welcome to King County Connects, where we connect you to the important regional issues in the county. I'm Enrique Cerna. Affordable health care, curbing gun violence, and more services for military vets. Those are some of the initiatives proposed by County Executive Dow Constantine this year. Dow Constantine joins me now to talk in detail about those initiatives and much more. Good to have you here. Welcome. I'm very pleased to be here. Thanks for having me. Well, let's talk about the state of the county and how you see it. Um, you have said that you, you believe that the state of the county, particularly county government, is strong considering the great recession that we've all experienced and how government has had to kind of redefine itself. What are your main concerns, though, about the county and, and its future? Well, the, uh, the county government is strong. Uh, we have put the county back on sound financial footing. I, the county council, all of our valued employees over the course of the last several years, and we've done it uh, by finding ways to innovate so that we're not simply choosing between increased revenues or decreased services, but that we're finding new 21st century ways to deliver for the people. Uh, revenue will continue to be a challenge. Uh, our economy has changed. Sales taxes are not going to come back to where they were before the recession. Uh, but also the state system of taxation is old and creaky and in need of review and improvement. Um, at the same time, you know, we have the ability to take on some of these cost pressures like health care costs and we've done that. And we do that by engaging our employees in a creative process of remaking the way we deliver services, remaking the way we address these problems rather than doing things the same way over and over. Uh, so, you know, the big challenges uh, for us really come from outside. They come from uh, federal government, for example, and its inability to kind of get its act together and move forward. Uh, comes from big challenges like uh, global climate change. Uh, not only our responsibility to reduce our emissions, but our response, uh, since we are in charge of a lot of the natural infrastructure of the county, uh, the mountains, the rivers, these things uh, are, are uh, you know, part of what we do as a county. Um, and it comes from uh, a challenge to make sure we have the infrastructure, educational infrastructure, healthcare infrastructure, human services, to enable the next generation to participate in the exciting prosperity that has distinguished our region. Um, One of the things that has been talked a lot at the state level by Governor Jay Ensley is uh, implementing lean management mm -hmm. uh, on that level. We'll see how that works out. But that's something that's been happening here in the county already. Um, mm -hmm. Tell me how you got about in trying to enhance that and how it's working. Uh, so, uh, just by way of shorthand, lean, to lean management is a way that you engage everyone in the workplace in identifying how to save time and money in delivering services and how to do that on a continuous basis because the circumstances in which we operate continually change. Uh, we, uh, first of all, I, I had Fred Jarrett come on as my deputy executive. Fred, 30 years at Boeing as well as a lot of time in, in the public sector. Uh, is really grounded in the lean principles. And so he's leading the charge to uh, educate our employees on lean, to give them the authority they need, the license they need in order to be able to improve the way they deliver services. And it's working. Uh, in our Department of Licensing, for example, employees got together, mapped out how a license is delivered, and then remade that process to do it faster, less expensively, and with greater satisfaction to the customer. And as we train more and more employees and give them the permission to be creative, we're saving time and money and delivering better service. Is it tough to get uh, county employees to buy in on this? You know, the, the stereotype of public employees is that they're very change averse mm -hmm. and they just want to kind of uh, clock in, do things the way they were trained to do and clock out. But in point of fact, they see things that aren't working. What they want is the authority to change them. So a lot of lean, a lot of our continuous improvement program is giving them that authority, is trusting them as partners in this process. And it is working. And not only does it improve the process, it improves employee morale. People want to be respected. They want to be listened to. That's what we're doing. How else do you see this um, being implemented elsewhere in the county and in any particular area that you really want to try to change? Well, uh, there are a lot of areas uh, where we have an opportunity to improve customer service, save time, save money. Uh, in our licensing, or excuse me, in our, in our permitting department, which uh, used to be uh, really uh, not well thought of. Uh, people complained a lot about it. 
Uh, we have had some financial challenges with the downturn in the economy, not as many permit applications coming in, less revenues, layoffs, but they have also figured out how to deliver permits much more efficiently. So a lot of them can be done right over the counter now. Uh, a lot of them now have a fixed fee, so you know what it's going to cost you. You don't have to wait and guess about how many hours you're going to be billed for. Uh, and that, you know, that's an example of where this approach of trusting our employees to figure out new solutions helps with our relationship with the public. And uh, you know, I talk about this with our council members and with our employees a lot, but we, you know, what we want is for people to uh, not just believe, but to be able to absolutely uh, see in a transparent government that we are making the most for the dollars we have. Because when we do that, they will be more likely to provide the dollars for those unmet needs in environmental protection, in justice, in human services across the board. Let's talk about human services. And, and one area that um, you, know, you, you addressed in, in your State of the County uh, uh, speech, but, and it's something that is a concern across the country is we have so many veterans coming home mm -hmm and obviously they have issues, but also they have trouble finding a job. Yeah. Uh, and you you really want to address that. Let's talk about what you want to do and how you think it can be implemented. Well, we have thousands of veterans um, returning and coming to live in King County. We have something on the order of 130,000 active duty and military veterans living in the county, bigger than the city of Bellevue, our second largest city. The people of King County have uh, really stepped up to our responsibility to these veterans, to people who have sacrificed for our country and our freedom. And they have passed twice now a Veterans and Human Services levy that attempts to fill in some of the gaps between the federal, state, and nonprofit programs that exist to help veterans transition, to help them deal with, uh, for instance, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, to get their lives on track and reintegrate into society. What I have proposed now is that we as a county take on the responsibility of knitting together the federal, state, local, and private nonprofit programs. Because what we know is that 40% of veterans are not connected to the services they've earned and that they need. So uh, I've recruited uh, three leaders, uh, retired General Pete Corelli, uh, retired Colonel Greta Kamamar, who's an Army nurse, mm -hmm. And, and a young veteran, Leo Flor, former, former Army inf infantry officer from the recent wars who's now a law student, to lead a group that's going to help us uh, really identify the best strategies, not for layering on more programs, but for making the programs we have work for veterans so that there's no wrong door. When a vet comes in, he or she has gotten to the, the exact kind of help that they have earned and that they need. What kind of change do you hope are you hoping that you might be able to set up some type of model here that could be used by the, the rest of the, either other counties, yeah. uh, other cities, the rest of the country? Well, absolutely. You know, one of the advantages of uh, living in and leading a county like King County is that uh, our region is a thought leader in a lot of different areas, public and private. I mean, this is the home of, of Boeing and Microsoft and Amazon and Costco. This is a place that is, is a, a hotbed of new ideas and intellectual energy. And, and that comes into the government, too. So what we find is that when we have new ideas here, we have a constituency that supports implementing them, and we're able then to share those with the rest of the country, as we are also willing to learn from the rest of the country. This idea of uh, better organizing the existing resources is not limited to the area of veterans. We've been uh, looking at this same client-focused approach in homelessness, for example. You don't just get the service that happens to exist at the agency you walk into. You get the right service for you, and we take responsibility for coordinating that. That's the new approach across all of these areas of service. Well, when we talk about service as well, we talk about health care, which is always the uh, probably the biggest area of concern for many uh, governments mm -hmm. and governmental entities because of the cost of health care and other things. Uh, this is another initiative that you run focus on as far as uh, trying to get more help for those that may be falling through the cracks. That's right. Uh, with the advent of federal health care reform, uh, we have a real opportunity here. There are something like 180,000 uninsured people in King County, folks who, uh, when they get sick, maybe show up in the emergency room, uh, and by that time they require very expensive treatment. That's treatment that you 
and I and all the rest of us end up paying for. So we have an opportunity to enroll folks in this newly expanded health care coverage, whether it's through Medicaid expansion or employer-provided health care or uh, the state health care exchange. And we're taking the responsibility to reach out to those folks. Uh, what we're doing is, first of all, having every county uh, department and division that interacts with the public to get equipped to also talk with them about whether they have health care coverage and then get them to our uh, experts who are uh, centered around our public health department to get signed up for health care. Uh, we've also, I, I'm creating a leadership circle of partners in the community. So Tom Gibbon from Swedish Hospital. Uh, we've got Maude Dedan from the um, Seattle Metropolitan Chamber of Commerce. We have Gordon McHenry from the nonprofit uh, um, Solid Ground. And then they're going to reach out to others who also have networks in the community so that we can reach across a population of two million people, find those folks who are now going to be eligible for insurance, get them plugged into the, the right way to sign up, and dramatically increase the, the level of, of, uh, of folks who are insured so that we're really creating a culture of coverage in King County. Do you think people are still uh, confused about the whole health care mandate and how it's going to work? Well, sure, and there's no reason for them not to be confused. Uh, health care is complicated now. Uh, health care reform is also complicated. One thing we have here uh, are experts in King County. We have excellent, excellent staff. And we have folks in this public health department and throughout our county who can help untangle some of this, make it accessible to the people it's supposed to help, uh, and ultimately uh, improve the quality of life across this county. And that's fundamentally why the people created this government in the first place. How many people do you think you could reach? Or well, you hoping our reach? goal is to reach the 180,000 folks uh, who are uninsured. Uh, clearly, it's a moving target. Uh, folks uh, sometimes have various reasons for not being plugged into the system. Uh, but you know, if we can get people into coverage where they're dealing with preventative, inexpensive preventative care early, rather than very expensive medical procedures later, it's going to save the whole society money. This is the approach we've taken with our employees inside King County and how we saved over $40 million in just a few years on employee health care costs because we're now focusing on wellness and prevention rather than treating folks once they become sick. Well, it's uh, health care related, unfortunately, and social service and human services related, but we have a gun problem. Yeah. And uh, we know in the aftermath of what happened in Newtown, that uh, this is an issue that uh, kind of rocked the nation. Uh, we still can't seem to find an answer. How do you want to address that in this coming year? Well, as has been reported many times, local governments in the state and country don't have a lot of authority directly over the regulation of firearms. We certainly do not in this state. The field's been occupied by the state government and the federal government. But what we do have is one of the nation's finest public health departments. Um, and, you know, just as guns are a public safety problem, they're also a public health problem. This is a public health crisis. So we're going to take a public health approach, a data-driven approach to identifying what we can do to reduce gun violence, to reduce the harm from guns. Um, do you think that taking a public health approach is actually a, a better way of dealing with this be, so that you don't get caught up in the I guess that debate and controversy over the NRA on this side and gun rights versus, okay, um, putting some uh, limits on AK-47s and these types of things. Well, it's an area in which we can do more than talk. It's an area in which we as a local government that runs the public health agency can do good. And so whether it's better or not, uh, it's better because we have some authority here. So we're going to collect data on uh, very simple questions for which a lot of data does not exist, like who's being harmed by guns. And uh, we're going in particular to institute a quarterly youth shooting review, which is similar to our quarterly uh, child death review. And it will show us the patterns, the circumstances, or where kids are uh, getting a hold of guns, using guns, being harmed by guns, so that we can identify places where through education or other means we can start to reduce that harm. We're going to look at who owns guns and how do they use them, how do they handle them, what kind of training do they have, and who sells guns and what role can they play in reducing uh, the violence that uh, everyone agrees is just completely unacceptable and out of hand. Do you own a gun? I do not. I do not. Ever had any desire to own one? I've never had a desire to own a gun. I respect people's right uh, to own a firearm. but. 
I, like most Americans, and in fact like most members of the National Rifle Association, believe that uh, folks who are not mentally competent should not be able to own a gun. And uh, I b also believe that uh, the kinds of weapons that are now being sold, basically modified weapons of war that have been used in some of these mass shootings, are not necessary for civilians to own. In taking this type of approach and with whatever you're able to find and in, in studying it from a public health uh, type of approach, um, how do you see that then maybe leading to some type of change in either in, in, in the legislature or elsewhere? Well, you know, we have found that it's uh, possible to modify behavior through this public health approach. It's happened with seat belts, it happened with cigarettes. You know, just by putting the warning on the label of cigarettes, which is a public health issue, we started to dramatically affect people's behavior. Uh, it uh, is a way in which we can start to change the thinking. Uh, increase the consciousness about the harm that guns are causing in our society because as, as dramatic as some of these incidents are, most of the gun injuries and the gun deaths are uh, going almost unnoticed by folks and it's because people become numb to it because they think it's inevitable. Uh, we believe that it's not inevitable uh, and that there are ways within our, um, within our grasp to start to reduce that harm, to get people's uh, behaviors modified so that there is uh, less opportunity for guns to be stolen, less opportunities for guns to get in the hands of kids, uh, less opportunities for, for uh, people to get a hold of guns when, when uh, if they were in a, in a state to be a little more thoughtful about it, they wouldn't go out and do something wrong. Well, let's change gears here and talk about some of the other things in the county that uh, will become uh, an election item this year, mm -hmm. and that is a uh, parks levy. And mm -hmm. um, what's what are you proposing there, and how do you, how do you think it'll be different from what we've had in the past? So King County's parks are f uh, funded in large part by a six-year levy. Uh, it was passed originally 12 years ago, and again six years ago, and it's up for renewal again this year. And I'm sending the county council. Uh, a proposal to do just that. We convened a, a large group of business and community leaders to consider what should this levy renewal look like. And the proposal I'm sending is uh, almost identical to their set of recommendations. They're focusing on maintenance and upkeep. They're focusing on linking together the parks and trails that we do have to, to get more use out of them. They're focusing on greater access to some of our major parks through uh, improved trailheads, parking, and so forth. Uh, they're focusing on some big opportunities that have come to us in this uh, in recent uh, time, like the acquisition of the Burlington Northern line all the way down the east side, which can become a um, trail as well as potential rail corridor. Uh, they're focusing on a cross uh, county from, from the lake to the sound, a south uh, county trail uh, that serves some really underserved communities. So um, the, the parks levy is uh, something that provides funding to local jurisdictions to, to maintain and keep up their parks as well. Uh, during the course of this last levy, we've lost a lot of other revenue that used to go into parks. The real estate excise tax has just crashed with the real estate market and it's going to be a long time before it gets back to where it was. And also, uh, you know, as our general fund has become more constrained, all general fund monies for the parks function have gone away. In 2011, the, the last of them were removed. So the park system, which is a growing system, where we acquire more open space, more trails to serve a growing population, is actually really challenged for funds and this is an opportunity to make sure that we maintain that legacy that was created by our parents and grandparents and is so much a part of the quality of life here in King County. You brought up earlier, uh, you touched on climate change and um, uh, you know, the whole issue of environment here. We have the sound that, uh, you know, there's a lot of concern about the health of Puget Sound. One of the biggest uh, issues now that is generating a lot of discussion uh, throughout the state and here is the coal trains. Yeah. Where do you stand on that? Uh, I am very much against bringing coal trains through King County, uh, coal trains that would deliver uh, vast amounts of coal to be shipped overseas and burned in China. Uh, the amount carried by those trains would generate more climate emissions than all of the emissions in all of Washington State. So all of our efforts to reduce our climate impact, to improve energy efficiency, to uh, uh, 
try to reduce our impact on the global environment would all be undone just by this, this one uh, act of bringing coal trains and, and shipping the coal to China. Uh, it is high time, and I'm glad the President addressed this in his State of the Union address, that we seriously take on the climate challenge. We cannot ignore this any longer. It's far past the time for dramatic action. And uh, this is just one local example of choices that are before us that will impact the future for uh, many generations to come. Of course, part of that debate is jobs and those that say that uh, if we decide not to go with these coal trains and you know that uh, terminal, that we're losing jobs. I do think that you know there's a legitimate argument that we need more jobs. Uh, the couple hundred jobs that would be created by this uh, are far outweighed by the jobs that we would lose in King County from the traffic tie-ups. And beyond that, uh, you know, the degradation to our climate, uh, the acceleration of uh, global warming is something that uh, will cause immeasur immeasurable harm. So uh, I am against that, and I think that folks understand why it's not a good trade-off for us. The other thing I actually wanted to ask you about is, uh, are you hopeful that we're going to get a basketball team? You know, uh, I believe Seattle and King County, the Central Puget Sound, is an excellent market for basketball, and I know the NBA believes that as well, notwithstanding the fact that our team was uprooted and moved to Oklahoma City. It's been a big loss for them. It's been a big loss for the people uh, of our county. I, I grew up here. I was out on the streets of Seattle celebrating back in the late 70s when we won the championship. So was I. Well, yeah. <laughs> in I remember Square. you. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, you were the guy stopping traffic yeah. there and letting everybody through. And, everybody uh, celebrated much more calmly then. They, they were, did. Yeah, it was People actually a lot of fun. Very yeah. respectful. But yeah. uh, I do believe that uh, the physics of the situation are in our favor, that ultimately uh, the economics dictate that there should be a team here. The people want it. Uh, I hear from so many people who want the NBA and NHL, actually. There are a lot of hockey fans here. Uh, and uh, I do believe it's going to happen. When? Well, that depends on a lot of circumstances outside of our control. But um, Seattle's a good sports town. It's a good basketball town. And we are going to have our Sonics back. And I'm looking forward to seeing you there. Yeah, I'll be there. Yes, I definitely will be there. Um, you are in your uh, fourth year. <laughs> What have you learned? What has surprised you in this job? Uh, well, you know, there's a couple things uh, that I wasn't able to see as much when I was a county council member representing one-ninth of the county uh, and really creating policy and legislating. Here, I, you know, I'm the boss of most of the employees in the county. I get to work with them more directly. Y we, you, the public of King County, have such amazing people working for you. They are under incredible strain with reduced budgets, but they deliver every day. And part of the issue is that they came to public employment in order to be able to serve their communities. You know, they, we do pay them, <laughs> but they have a, 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 sense, a spirit of service. And so they really want to do well. And our job is to create the circumstances where they can do that. Has it been tough? at times and frustrating at times and difficult. It, uh, it is tough and it is frustrating. Even in good times, uh, politics is tough business. But when you're dealing with shrinking budgets and constrained revenues and uh, you know mounting challenges, uh, it can become quite frustrating and the, and the trade-offs are tough. The choices you have to make are tough. But you know, on a personal level, the people have given me the privilege of doing something that has genuine meaning, of working to improve this community, of working to create circumstances that are going to allow the next generation to be successful, to live in a place with a great environment, to have opportunity for jobs and, and economic growth and moving up in the world. Uh, and, you know, that was a tremendous privilege. I've had a lot of jobs in my life. Not all of them allowed me to do something that was going to uh, last beyond my time. And this does, and it's a real privilege. 
Dr. Constantine, thank you very much for your time. We appreciate it very much. Thank you. And thanks for joining us for King County Connects. Please visit us online at kingcounty.gov slash KCTV. I'm Enrique Cerna. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time.